welcome back to the last session of day two. This is a sponsor session. We will get an insight into what's going on at our sponsors, well, companies. And the first one to talk today will be Nicolas Brieu. And uh, he's presenting on behalf of ThinkOS. I hope I pronounced that one right. And uh, I'm looking forward to the presentation. Please stop uh, sharing for now and we will sort out the issues hopefully while we present another talk or uh, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, and then um, Kirsten Peterson already talked to us uh, about what Heartflow is doing last night and it looks all the same today. Uh, I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> you go ahead. Yeah, I apologize. It's exactly the same presentation, but I assume several of you haven't heard it yet. So. Um, yeah, my name is Kerstin Petersen. I'm a staff research scientist at Heartflow. I've been working there for seven years and uh, the topics that I mostly work on are in medical image analysis and machine learning. Um, Heartflow has been founded roughly 10 years ago by two professors at Stanford, uh, Chris Zarens, who led the cardiovascular department, and Chris Taylor, who was a professor for mechanical engineering at Stanford and uh, is our current CTO. So. Uh, since then, uh, Heartflow has grown a lot. Uh, they started off as a research group with PhD students and postdocs, and now we are a company of roughly 400 employees with uh, employees of all kinds of backgrounds. So we do cloud computing, uh, CFD, uh, machine learning, medical image analysis. There are a lot of human experts who can annotate uh, salespeople and so on. Um, I will let you know more about that. So today um, I would We'd like to give you um, a presentation on who Heartflow is and um, what we focus on. So here you can see a patient who is uh, holding his chest. He obviously has chest pain and there can be multiple reasons for that. He could be stressed or it's also plausible that uh, he has symptoms of coronary artery disease. And at Heartflow we are very much dedicated to this case. We want to help physicians diagnose, prognose and treat coronary artery disease. Coronary artery disease is caused by a buildup of plaque in the coronary artery wall. You can see that here on the right, there's an artery vessel and uh, this wall here is extended, which obstructs the blood flow to the heart. And uh, that can lead to a heart attack, for instance. Uh, we have to distinguish two different cases here. One is obstructive disease and the other non-obstructive disease. If the disease is mild, then uh, medication or lifestyle changes uh, are recommended to treat this. However, if the stenosis is very severe, then uh, either a stent, so that's a metallic coil, uh, needs to be inserted or a vessel from the leg or the arm needs to be uh, taken to bypass that diseased area. Coronary artery disease is uh, very common. Um, it's actually the most common form of um, uh, yeah, the, the, it um, accounts for the um, majority of the cardiovascular disease uh, besides stroke and peripheral artery disease. Every third of us um, at the moment uh, is likely to die from cardiovascular disease. In the US alone, 650,000 people roughly die from a fatal heart attack each year. And a lot of money is spent on alleviating this situation. More than $200 billion each year is spent in the US, US alone on diagnosis and treatment of patients with coronary artery disease. If you have uh, the symptoms of coronary artery disease, you typically go to a hospital and then a set of tests, non-invasive tests is run. This could, for instance, be uh, stress testing. So you run on a treadmill or EKG, nuclear tests or a CT angiogram. Unfortunately, all of these tests are not really very accurate. Uh, they produce false negatives and false positives. All, all of these have a different trade out of these two. And so physicians uh, typically run multiple tests to rule out that the patient has obstructive disease. However, this is not always uh, very easy. Sometimes these tests might be inconclusive. And so to be very cautious, the, patient, the physician often refers the patient to the CAS lab and there an invasive coronary angiogram is taken. So in this um, uh, acquisition there, the patient uh, gets a catheter in the artery and uh, there's of course a risk for the patient because the catheter might perforate the coronary artery wall and it's also very costly. It turns out that two out of three patients roughly don't need to be in the cath lab. They actually have non-obstructive disease and could be treated with medication or lifestyle changes but this is first figured out in the cath lab. 
And so HeartFlow's mission is really to offer a new pathway. We rely on a standard CT angiogram as it is already used in practice. And then we simulate the blood flow using principles of machine learning and computational fluid dynamics. I will explain that in a bit more detail. So uh, physicians around the world upload CT images to our cloud. And there we have a whole pipeline of algorithms that we apply to these CT images to extract a very precise anatomical model of the coronary arteries and the aorta. And uh, this actually has subboxal accuracy. Unfortunately, not always um, we can guarantee that our automated solution is perfect. So there are also human experts for quality control that correct these segmentations where needed or at least check it. As the next step, we this um, anatomical model is consumed by the physiological model. And uh, there we use principles of physics. Um, so for instance, we can relate the baseline flow, the total demand of flow um, on the myocardial mass that we have extracted in the anatomical model, or the vessel morphology tells us something about the demand of the um, myocardial perfusion territories. Once uh, these two ingredients are in place, the anatomical model and the physiological model, then we can solve the Navier-Stokes equations uh, for velocity and pressure. And uh, the output of this step is seen in the bottom left corner. Uh, we can see this color-coded map where blue indicates a similar pressure to the pressure in the aorta. And then when it uh, falls off, it turns red, which means that at that location, we face obstructive disease. Uh, so this would be a location where a stent or a bypass would be warranted. The output of this entire pipeline, so this one shows the same uh, steps that I just showed, uh, explained, will be a, either a PDF report, which summarizes the most important measurements, for instance, the location where the obstructive disease is. And um, we also give the physician the opportunity to interact with the model on uh, an iPad or an iPhone. We have uh, very good clinical results. Um, so there are several papers and the references are given in the back of, in the end of this presentation. It turns out that with this new pathway of heart flow, we are able to avoid a lot of the unnecessary angiograms in the CAS lab. We still refer the patients that require um, a stent or a bypass to the CAS lab, but a lot of the patients with non-obstructive disease don't, uh, are not referred. And this saves a lot of money because um, coronary um, angiograms are very expensive. HeartFlow has um, obtained regulatory approval. Uh, 10 years ago, we got the CE mark. In 2014, FDA approval. And in 2017, the equivalent in Japan, the PMDA approval. Uh, we also have our uh, reimbursement for our technology in place, insurance coverage uh, for most of the US and uh, other geographies, especially the UK and Japan. And um, our technology is used every day on hundreds of patients. At this point, we have more than 75,000 patients that were successfully um, yeah, assessed with our heart flow analysis, especially the leading hospitals in the world are very eager to um, adopt, adopt our technology. Our flow, as I said, um, is a spin-off from Stanford, and this is still reflected in the company today. There's a lot of emphasis on publications. We have more than 400 clinical and technically, technical publications. We also have um, issued a lot of patents, and uh, we also conduct a lot of clinical trials to uh, gather further evidence for our product. This is an overview of the current landscape uh, of different uh, modalities that can, can be used for diagnosis, prognosis, or treatment planning. So for the assessment of the plaque, the stenosis degree, the, function, the assessment of the functional significance of a lesion, or an assessment of the perfusion of the myocardium. And you can see that very different tests are used for these different use cases. Our vision is to replace all of these different tests using only CT images and then our machine learning and computational fluid algorithms. So um, that's what we are working on at the moment. And um, what we then hope to achieve is uh, a complete comprehensive view of the state of coronary artery disease. So we can assess uh, stenosis, the uh, functional uh, significance, 
using our flow analysis, then uh, we also gain insights about the perfu perfusion territories that are affected when a specific vessel is obstructed uh, or blocked. Um, then we also want to assess different types of plaques, which tell us something about the disease progression. And we also have the opportunity to uh, model the uh, impact on the functional uh, significance when, for instance, placing multiple stents. Imagine you have, for instance, three stenosis in sequence, then it might be unclear if all of these three stenosis need to be treated, maybe only the second one to uh, get the flow again back above the critical value of 0 0.8, so 80% of the um, aorta flow. And uh, with the simulation, the physician can yeah, do this the day ahead of the surgery. If we look ahead, what where we could go from here, there are several other applications. We could um, also simulate the blood flow in the brain or in the peripheries, and um, there are also many coronary applications that we can still address in the future. We're hiring, um, so if this is all exciting to you, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, as I said, we work on many exciting topics in medical image analysis, machine learning and deep learning, uh, comprising segmentation, um, registration, uncertainty, quantification. And um, as I mentioned in the beginning, our head office is in California, uh, in Redwood City, just south of San Francisco. But we also work very tightly together with Ben Glocker at Imperial College London. Uh, you can also see that our Austin uh, office in, uh, is an, an option if you don't have as many researchers there at the moment. That's why it's colored in green. And you can also work remotely in several geographies. And uh, here are some references uh, for you to get more information. And with that, uh, thank you very much. For the very interesting talk and, of course, for supporting us. Um, we've been working on uh, the yeah coronary artery disease in different ways, also uh, on all uh, different modalities, uh, intravascular ultrasound, OCT, and uh, CT. And for us, it is uh, really uh, impressive what you're showing here because we try to uh, get the vessel shape from the CT and it's not always straightforward. And I actually got a question here in the in the chat as well, uh, who was wondering, where somebody was wondering um, how those uh, potential failures in reconstructing the vessel shape actually affect your models, your flow models? Yeah, very good question. So there's actually um, a relationship, I think, of the power of three or so on the geometric accuracy of the vessel. So um, as I mentioned, all our geometries are segmented with subvoxel accuracy. Um, there's, of course, a certain amount of leeway that we can afford. Um, we are mostly concerned with uh, the focal stenosis, uh, so the, the stenosis that uh, can potentially have a big impact. But yeah, if there's a tightening then, and we get it wrong, then that will have a big impact on the flow analysis. Um, fortunately, we have very experienced analysts that uh, can detect potential errors, and the algorithms are also state of the art. They have been targeted to, towards this application. Well, sounds great. And another question uh, along the same line to some degree is um, to what extent you combine machine learning and physical modeling, particularly learning the PDEs and uh, or to integrate that PDE learning with the uh, learning workflow completely? Yeah, so at the moment, um, our flow analysis is done with based on principles of physics. Um, we are working on accelerating um, the CFD where possible. There's some challenges in bifurcation areas for, uh, with turbulent flows. Um, so that's still active research, but uh, yeah, we are very interested and in actively following the current progress in academia to adopt that also for our uh, mission. Well, sounds great. Thank you very much again. And Thank we you. are moving on now. And uh, well, in a second try, we will have hopefully now the presentation by ThinkOS. Ah, there I see some. At least you can see me. And I can hear okay. some. That's wonderful. Okay, I can super. see great. here and now the slides and we are happy. Okay, great. So we can start. Uh, so my name is Nicolas Brieux. I'm a principal uh, software engineer at SnakeOS. Um, so SnakeOS has been founded in uh, June 2020. So it's a pretty recent company, but actually we already have quite some uh, history because we are a subsidiary of uh, Brain Lab. Uh, so we are uh, around 200 employees, um, and we are headquarters in Munich, and uh, so 150 employees in Munich, and then 50 employees uh, shared between the Tel Aviv and the San Diego offices. 
So that's a little bit about who we are and so what we do are um, we focus on two main topics. So the one is building patient specific model for precision med uh, procedures and optimized treatment methods. So this uh, can be decomposed into two parts. So trying to, uh, so building a universal patient models that we couple with uh, individual anatomy that we aggregate from CT, MR, or ultrasound, trying to create digital representation of his patient. And we don't, we are not only interested in creating this uh, universal static patient model, but we're also interested in um, studying how this model evolves over time. So during surgery, for instance. So and uh, we update this patient specific model using a uh, person's special position of the instruments, as well as some workflow information that we automatically extract from video data. So that's the first big uh, focus of the company. The second focus is to create open interfaces so that we can interact with uh, other businesses. So we don't, we don't not to provide only closed algorithm, but also to provide uh, open inter interfaces so that we can work with um, different startups. Um, so when we check at uh, the different technologies that we are using, so we first couple um, a universal statistic uh, patient model with uh, individual anatomy of each patient, uh, which is aggregated from different diagnostic uh, images. Uh, so, and uh, this allows us to create a digital and individual representation for each patient. And so to make this uh, representation dynamic, so I already said, so we are using video data and spatial navigation data. And taking all this into account, we can actually uh, uh, flow back this information back into the universal patient model uh, to uh, to derive uh, statistical data from uh, from multiple patients. I will go a little bit more in detail about these different steps. So we, as I said, so we built a universal. Uh, we built a digital patient model based mainly on the universal, universal anatomical mat, uh, atlas. Um, so, and this uh, universal anatomical mat, atlas, um, it has been already at Brain Lab for quite some time. Um, and uh, it basically consists of 3D models of the different organs, anatomies, and also of their uh, respective physical characteristics. And given the anatomical atlas, we can then simulate uh, any anatomy and match uh, the um, uh, and and uh, sorry uh, and match the obtained simulated scans to each patient. So and uh, matching the patient to the atlas then already directly give us the segmentation of the patients automatically. So there are in this step there is no segmentation step. So it's really just uh, we match to the atlas and then the matching give us the segmentation. So it's. Um, it, it integrates different type of uh, diagnostic imaging like MR or CT, and it also works over different uh, anatomical, anatomical objects in the whole body, for instance, the brain or in the spine areas in these examples. So it works pretty nicely uh, for uh, the uh, objects which are standard so far, which can be modeled with an atlas. However, there is some limitations. So for typically, if, uh, um, if um, if some objects cannot be cannot be universally modeled, uh, the the segmentation still has to be corrected. And maybe the most typical example for this are pathologies like tumor. So you you will have the brain, which is quite a standard between different patients. But as soon as you have uh, anomalies in the brain, then you will have to update the atlas to account for the, uh, those anomalies. Uh, and that's the first application of deep learning at uh, SnakeOS. So is to correct the final segmentation for object to account for objects that cannot be universally modeled in the atlas. The second application of uh, deep learning at SnakeOS is to assist uh, the restoration process to the atlas using uh, machine learning based detected objects or landmarks. So uh, we detect objects in CT, MR, or ultrasound, and then we match those landmarks or objects to the uh, objects or landmarks in the atlas, to, and that allows us to, for instance, pre-position the atlas before the restoration. So to give an example of um, how we complement the atlas with deep learning, so one example is the uh, pathology detection and segmentation. Uh, so the goal there is to detect a segment uh, brain tumor independently of the different type uh, of the tumor, so independently of the texture, of the shape, or the size, and the position. 
And here on the bottom left, you see an example of the model that we developed. So it's based on the anatomy, uh, an anomaly detection algorithm that we um, improve with uh, adding a supervised head for, uh, to extend it to a semi-supervised learning. And this, uh, well, this supervised part of the network is actually working really, really nicely. Also because we are working on a very extensive set of uh, internally level data sets. Uh, so it's based both on set of scans without pathologies and set of scans for which we have for which we have pathologies and for which we have quite a lot of annotations from medical doctors. Uh, on the right, so you see come some uh, example of the approach, and uh, on the top right, you can see the integration between the at, the objects uh, segmented via the atlas uh, via the registration to the atlas and the objects like the tumor, uh, which are semantic with deep learning in this case. So it's, uh, it's really complementary, the two approaches. Um, another application of deep learning at SnakeOS currently is uh, the analysis of, st of, the, of the spine. So in this case, we aim to detect cervical, thoracic, lumar, vertebra, as well as the sacrum. And it's used either for X-ray analysis, uh, but also for 3D patient model registration. So we basically, uh, Create a fake X-ray from uh, from 3D scans. Detect uh, the uh, the different um, the different vertebras in the in this fake uh, 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 X-ray, and then we use uh, triangulation to actually find the position of the different vertebrae. And then these positions of the vertebrae can be used to initialize the registration of the uh, of the vertebrae in the atlas. So to do that, we use at the same time gold standard annotations so by medical doctors, but also silver silver standard annotation from the uh, anat from the initial anatomical atlas based segmentation on CT and MR scans. Uh, so we use a quite recent uh, standard uh, detection network, like an efficient debt, an efficient debt uh, that allows us to balance between model performance and inference speed depending on the use case. So either if, if it is for spine planning for detection in X-ray or for fast registration and preposition. So that's basically two examples of how we use deep learning to create the static uh, anatomical model of the patient. What we are actually interested in is, uh, is not really the segmentation when we do pathology segmentation, it's really build a model uh, of the patient with which we can interact afterwards. So for instance, brain segmentation is only interesting to us because once we have a once we have a segmentation, we can model this deformation related, for instance, to brain shift. So it's an example I give here on the right. So typically we have a preoperative scan with a planning, uh, which has been done on these preoperative scans. And then we have an intraoperative scan in which we can observe uh, a brain shift. So when you open the brain to uh, to do a surgery, then because of the difference of pressure, the, the brain will tend to, co to compress itself. So it's how to adapt the plan to what's happening actually during the surgery. So what we do is we is we build the finite element uh, model of the patient, uh, and then we can deform this finite element model of the patient given the intraoperative scan, and this deformation can then be applied to uh, to the um, to the to the preoperative planning, so that we can match actually the preoperative planning to what we see during the uh, during the surgery to the um, what during the surgery. And where it becomes interesting is when when should we actually trigger this event? So an idea to trigger this event is to try to understand what happens during the surgery. So for instance, we are also working on analyzing the dynamic data in the surgery. So trying to segment, for instance, uh, the, um, the surgical procedures into different phases. Uh, so we use for that different techniques like unsupervised temporal clustering, also supervised classification methods. But also we are also developing methods to, uh, to do automatic det object detection to, to guide the temporal segmentation of the, uh, of the surgery phases. Another way to, uh, to include dynamic data is actually when we, uh, we do, for instance, tumor segmentation. The tumor segmentation itself is what is interesting, but what is also interesting is to track uh, what happens to the tumor over time. So typically, if, if you can follow a patient over the first uh, radio surgery and then you can have different follow-up events, what you can do, if you have the segmentation of the tumor for each of these events, you can uh, correlate the, uh, the, resp the, uh, the dose uh, that the patient receives uh, with, uh, the, for instance, tumor shrinkage. And 
analyzing this correlation and uh, between the dose and the shrink of the tumor, you can actually try to predict the best optimal treatment for each individual patient. So for instance, depending on the position of the tumor or depending on the number of metastases, for instance, you can you can try to optimize the dose for, uh, for the patients and optimize the, uh, well, uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, the radiotherapy uh, planning, basically. So it's, it's really, what, what we do as NECOS is not only, not only building this anatomical patient model, but also to try to see how we can integrate time information in, and uh, deformation and update of this uh, anatomical model. So either to, um, either to try to predict the best, uh, the best uh, treatment for the patient, but also to, to, uh, to try to predict what is going to happen to this patient model during surgery. Um, yeah, so it's a brief presentation of what we do. So it was more part on the analytical mapping. So I didn't present what we do on the more open, uh, on the open uh, platform thing. But uh, if you are interested by joining in SnakeOS, uh, we are also recruiting also machine learning engineers. So feel free to reach out. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And actually, uh, that is a good uh, idea to maybe discuss in more detail because it seems that you have a quite ambitious goal there, uh, modeling the patient quite generically, if I understand correctly. Mm -hmm. So, uh, thank you very much again. Thank you also for the support. Um, we are a little bit tight on the time right now. And uh, any further discussions, any interest in what's going on there, I would like to defer to private discussions on Gather Town or tomorrow, maybe during the day. Um, we are moving on now to the third presentation. And if I get that right, uh, the presentation by Page AI will be given today by uh, Hamid Agdam or Agdam, is that correct? Or That's correct, that's Hamid. Okay, hello. Good evening hello. here from Germany at least. And uh, I'd be looking forward to your presentation. Please go ahead. Yeah, sure. So let me just share this screen. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Hamed and I'm an AI scientist in Page AI. Uh, a little bit about Page AI, we are funded in 2017 and our headquarters is in New York, United States. But we have also different teams in different geographical locations. And our aim is to mainly uh, bring AI into the field of digital pathology. In the next 10 minutes, I will be mainly talking about using AI to detect prostate cancer. And I will be starting with a few background about how the digital pathology, how the pathology process works in general, and uh, what is our current prostate detection model, and how we are actually using our AI to help human experts to make a better decision. So if you're not familiar with uh, the pathology lab process, uh, it usually involves uh, seven different steps. The first one, we have the specimen which is the biopsy or needle biopsy of, of a part of the body organ. And it comes to, to the lab, it is registered, then we cut it, put it in a cassette. And once this is done, uh, we remove the water from that. It usually takes one or two days. And once this is done, uh, then uh, the kind of dried uh, specimen is, uh, goes into paraffin. This usually takes another day. And once this step also is finished, it is cut into much thinner pieces. So a specimen could just be cut into probably various slides. And now at this stage, in stage five, what we have is a seen part of the tissue on a glass. But what we can see is almost nothing. So uh, there is the sixth stage, which is staining usually with chemical materials. And once this is done, we can see the cells, we can see the tissue, we can differentiate it from the background, from different parts. And these chemical uh, materials usually react for, react to uh, cancers and uh, other cells differently. And in the last stage, which is the seventh stage, this is where the human expert or pathologist is study the stained uh, slide and make a decision whether there is a cancer or they also do some probably deeper analysis such as grading. So the main difference between digital pathology and traditional pathology lies only in the last step. In the tra traditional pathology, a human experts put the slide under a microscope and just magnify it, uh, move it around and 
in order to find the cancer. With digital pathology, however, the traditional microscope is replaced by a special digital scanner. So what we do, we put different glasses, slides into a scanner, we scan them at once, and then the pathologist, instead of just looking at the uh, small, uh, just hole in the microscope, they can just see the things and the, the entire tissue digi digitized uh, slide in a screen uh, in different magnification levels, move around easily, and um, then make a decision based on that. So uh, the way it usually works is that this is a slide that I just showed you. This is an stained slide for a prostate only on one glass. So usually what we have, we have uh, different cuts from different cores in a needle biopsy, and this is only just one. One of the challenges is here we are usually de de dealing with very large images. In this particular example, it is 20,000 by 16,000, which is not considered a regular size. This is a small size slide. The slides we have, usually they are about 50,000 by 40,000, sometimes even larger for breast or other, uh, other tissues. But for prostate, we are mostly dealing with 50,000 by 40,000 slides. And as you can guess, this is a very, very large image. The way pathologist makes a decision to say if there is a cancer in this tissue is that uh, they can't, it's usually very challenging or even impossible to make a decision at this magnification level. What we need, we need to magnify further into the core, again, magnify further until we magnify around 20X into the core, into the slide. And then human experts just analyze the regions and how they form the morphology, different uh, criteria in order to make a decision if a region is cancerous. In this case, uh, I have pointed with the arrows, the cancerous regions, suspicious regions. So once the pathologists do that, then they can make a decision whether this is cancerous or not. But how it works is that, as you can guess, uh, the entire core must be searched exhaustively, meaning that every region should be checked, should be studied by the pathologist. It doesn't matter if it is a traditional microscope or digital pathology, they have to move around. Sometimes because of the, um, the morphology of the region, a human expert needs to magnify it slightly further or zoom out just to have a slightly more context about the region and make a decision. And as you can guess, just studying one core on one slide is a time consuming process. Now imagine 12 cores for just one prostate biopsy. It's going to be very time consuming. In addition to that, uh, one of the things we did actually at PAID before actually going to the next slide was that we had some human experts and we wanted to see their performance on uh, finding cancer in prostate slides. So usually cancers, depending on their, their stage, depending on how they are invasive, they could just uh, compose uh, small regions or they could be very large. So as you can see here, when this cancerous region or the suspicious region is small, it is smaller than 0.6 millimeters, the sensitivity of pathologists are less than 50%. But as the uh, size of the suspicious region increases, the sensitivity also goes up because there is a less chance of missing a cancer. So if we miss all the regions, we are just going to say all the, all the slide is benign. And, but if the, cancer, the cancerous region is large, then there is a less chance of missing that. So as a result, when the uh, suspicious region is large, that there is a less chance of, just to miss it. One of the other challenges is that in the past 10 years, there is a study from 2019 showing that the number of pathologists have been decreasing in North America, in the United States, specifically in the past 10 years, leading to have more new cancer cases per pathologist. Now think about this globally on uh, developing countries, underdeveloped countries. So there is a shortage of pathologists. And remember that uh, pathology is a gold standard to identify cancer for prostate. So if there is not enough pathologists, if we cannot detect the cancer in early stages, we are essentially endangering human life because we have to detect the cancer in early stages. So at PAGE, our mission is to empower pathologists 
clinicians and researchers to make accurate diagnosis and treatment decisions, and even faster by unlocking insight and information from tissue. So with that, I'm going to talk about specifically our page prostate detection model. So for page prostate, what we have, we have a large data set composed of huge slides, in this case, 20,000 by 16,000 and only one binary label. So we have a huge slide and we just say if the entire slide is cancer or benign, we don't know what is the segmentation mask or which region is cancer. We just know there is a cancer in this slide because usually the pathology reports, they only include the, um, the outcome, not the locations. So we have slide level labels and our slides are huge. We have no segmentation masks. We have to figure out a way to train a model, which is first able to uh, make a decision to uh, classify a slide either as suspicious or benign. And in addition to that, to provide the suspicious regions heat map to pathologists. So we have a pioneering uh, model that is published in 2019 in Nature Medicine. We formulated this problem as a multiple instance uh, learning problem where we are just simply dividing the entire slide into smaller patches, run over a network, which is a CNN in this case, on, on each tile and get probability scores for each tile. Once this is done, we are just ranking the tiles based on their scores and take top tiles, assign pseudo label to them, and then use an asymmetric loss function to train the network. And this usually happens in almost all these slides and for several epochs. And once this is done, we have a CNN. We have a model which is able to tell if a, if a tile, if a small tile in a slide is cancerous or not. And to further improve our results, we have the next stage where we run our trained model on this slide and pick the regions with the highest probability score of being suspicious, and then extract the patches around those regions pass them through an RNN aggregator and come up with just one number from the, for the entire slide, telling that if the slide is suspicious or benign. So here on the left, you see the results from uh, our paper and our improved model. And the orange bar here refers to our results in the published paper. Our AUC of detection is over 99% on MSK test data set. And later we improved the model. We were able to get closer to 99.5% AUC for prostate detection. And what is more interesting, at least to me, is the figure on the right. Uh, on the top right, you see the uh, heat map of suspicious regions annotated by human experts. On the bottom is the suspicious regions that are detected by our model and then we generate a suspicious region heat map, show them to the pathologist or even compare them against our annotated data. And as you can see, that's a pretty decent heat map compared to what we have from human pathologists. So we have carried out extensive experiments and studies just to understand different, um, uh, to understand our models better. One of them is to first see how good is our models against a uh, different scanners and how good they are against uh, different data sets. So we have in only in our training set, we have slides which are scanned by a perio scanner. We have also uh, some test samples which are scanned only with flips. So we don't have any slides in the training set which are scanned by flips. And what we see here, there, had, there was a 2.65% drop in AUC when we uh, test our models on uh, Philips scanners. And then also we asked some external institutes to provide us some MSK data. And we realized that there was a 5.84% drop in AUC when we used external data. So as you can see here, the uh, gap between different scanners is not that significant in terms of AUC but we are still improving the models and we have been actually able to improve these, uh, these, uh, these uh, um, numbers and make them more uniform, closer to our MSK in-house test set. 
and we are still working on that to improve the model. So now let's say we have a model which is able to say if a slide is cancerous or not, and also it can provide us uh, the heat map of suspicious regions, how we can help human experts to make a better decision. We have a viewer where uh, the pathologist can open the slide, uh, zoom in, pan it, or just study it at different magnification levels. As you can see in the top, we can uh, show until up to the magnification level of 80x if the slide contains that, that information, but mostly for prostate slides, what we have are in 20x or 40x. So once the pathologists see the slide, they can just study it, make a decision. But in addition to that, we also provide the heat map of suspicion regions. So the pathologists can, can just study them if they miss the region or if there is a false positive here. And what we did actually after that, we carried out a study where we asked pathologists just to make uh, to uh, classify our test samples using only human expert. Then we also added the functionality of using our page AI and revising their decision. So we, uh, we, we had pathologists with different expertise levels, of course, not everybody is an um, expert in the field. So we have different pathologists with different expertise. What we saw was that, uh, just look at the red um, arrow and uh, red dots on, on the plot. So the pathologists without AI, the sensitivity for that pathology is what about 67%. Using our page AI, it was increased to about 85%. And the same thing uh, happens for, for the green pathologist as well. But for the blue pathologist, which is an expert in the field, very well known, we see a slightly uh, less increase, but still substantial from 87 to about 94%, which is a substantial improvement. So we can have faster detection, we can have more accurate detection, if we just uh, have pathologists and also page prostate together. So remember from early slides, it showed you some numbers how uh, human experts perform on smaller uh, cancerous regions. And when we ask human experts also to revise the decision based on our uh, page AI page prostate model, we realized that uh, there was the sensitivity increases from 46% to 83% when uh, human experts use page AI to revise their decision. And why there is this substantial increase? Uh, it's simple because the suspicious regions are very small in these cases, and there is a chance that human expert, because of fatigue, because of turn nets, because, because of distraction, or many different reasons, they might miss that suspicious regions and just classify a cancerous slide as benign. So, uh, but using page AI, since AI doesn't get tired or get distracted, they just run it on, on this slide. They are pretty fast. They provide some uh, heat map to human experts. They can study and verify if this is actually a suspicious slide. And this way we were able to improve the results for smaller uh, cancerous regions dramatically, but you can also see somehow substantial increase in larger tumor sizes. So in sum, uh, what we want to do is to, we want to improve patient care and outcome. We want to decrease the labor and diagnostic cost. And also we are looking forward to have some kind of prognostic insights using our page AI model. And I want to add that we are hiring AI engineers and AI scientists actively if you are interested, you can visit our page. And if you have any questions, you can send me an email. My email is in this, uh, in, in this slide. So with that note, I'm going to close the talk. Thank you very much, everyone. Well, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. And indeed, uh, I can clearly see the motivation and I cl can clearly see the ambition in the project you are talking about. So probably you need to hire a lot more uh, people to make that. Yeah, happen. absolutely. Yeah. We are actively hiring from almost all over the world. So. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I would really like to refer any further questions to email, like emailing you directly, if possible at all, uh, because we want to move on. We have another or the last uh, presentation now, which is uh, only a video presentation, but I want to remind everybody, 
there's something else to come. I've seen something happening here around me and it looks a little strange to me. So uh, you want to hang on while we are listening and viewing the last video presentation of our sponsor, Biometech. Driving Change, Biometric Science Campus Lübeck. PASPADIA is an acronym for patient-centric, smartphone-based diagnostics with local and uh, central AI platform for primary care in rural areas. Well, medicine requires often rapid near patient diagnosis. For example, monitoring the curative cause of patients with mobility impairments in rural areas. Current smartphones are suitable for this task due to their widespread use, built-in sensor technology and uh, computing capacity. Therefore, Paspadia develops appropriate attachment and applications for smartphones where ophthalmological examinations become possible in primary care setting. The project consists of four sub-projects which we present today to you. Well, first of all, let's look at the relevance of the topic. The number of patients with diabetes mellitus type 1 and 2 currently amounts to 7.5 million in Germany. Diabetic retinopathy constitutes one of the most seri serious complications of diabetes and affects approximately 10% of these patients. Therefore, the adherence to regular eye screening is quite important to diagnose diabetic retinopathy at an early stage when it can be treated. Smartphone-based fundus cameras and the evolution of artificial intelligence may enable this screening in primary care setting, which might improve the adherence. For example, imagine a couple, John and Lisa. John suffers from a neurological disease that binds him to bed. Lisa has been diagnosed with diabetes mellitus 15 years ago, but denies to go to the screening because she's not willing to leave John for more but an hour. For her, the offer of getting the screening done with her general practitioner suits her very well. The result of diabetic retinopathy showed no DR. So she is confident that she does not need to go to the specialist and can stay with John. We at the Institute of Family Medicine support the project from an implementation science perspective. Implementation science deals with the evidence to practice gap and thus focuses on the question how to ensure that the best available evidence is transferred into daily clinical practice. The best technology is of no use if its implementation in the healthcare system is neglected. Therefore, we have interviewed general practitioners, medical assistants and ophthalmologists about the barriers and enablers for the acceptance of AI-supported systems in primary care. Moreover, we conducted a meta-analysis to determine the current state of knowledge and diagnostic performance of deep learning screening methods for diabetic retinopathy in primary care. The sensitivity and specificity were overall high, with a pool sensitivity of um, 87% and specificity of 90%, roughly comparable with uh, ophthalmologists. But nevertheless, the sensitivity and specificity have always to be evaluated with regard to the prevalence. Human vision is a technical masterpiece of nature. However, the imaging of the retinal structure is somewhat demanding because we have a permanent eye movement, an inefficient backscattering of light and also a reduction in pupil size when illuminating with white light. But if we now take an image with a white light source, we can get an RGB image of the retina. But sometimes this RGB image with its three channels is very, it's not sensitive enough to differentiate between healthy and pathological structures. And this is the, uh, the, the question now is, can we overcome this issue with a technical improvement? And this is where our idea is based on. Instead of a white light source, we're using a multispectral flash sequence. And with the slow motion function of the smartphone, 
we can extract the single channels of the multispectral light source. The benefit of this is now that we have different light matter interaction of each single channel. And this interaction make, enabled us to enhance the color contrast of the images, leading us to a very high precision diagnos diagnostic. And this leads us to another important question. Is there any way how we can automatically evaluate these multispectral imaging sequences based on an AI learning algorithm? And this is where the next project is based on, the deep learning algorithm for the automatic detection of retinal disease. In Paspadia, we focus on using state-of-the-art deep learning models to elevate, evaluate the images captured by the smartphone-based multispectral imaging system to achieve high performance on diabetic retinopathy detection. As for any deep learning-based system that is to be deployed in medical care, several challenges arise concerning the intrinsic black box character and the typical overconfidence of deep learning frameworks. Providing a disease detection algorithm that is both highly accurate as well as trustworthy and self-explanatory so that general practitioners on the one hand do not hesitate to use the device and on the other hand can make reliable and confident diagnosis requires sophisticated model design and training. To tackle these challenges, the development of a holistic detection algorithm is pursued in Paspadia that in addition to the predicted DR severity grade computes precise segmentations of lesions being related to DR that are provided to the practitioner to enable him or her to self-verify the prediction of the algorithm. Moreover, to give the practitioner a better understanding of how confident the system's diagnosis is, we aim to implement the model to not only compute a prediction, but also to estimate the model's uncertainty. To this end, we use deep ensemble models and investigate the integration of probabilistic methods into our detection algorithm to further improve the calibration of the predictive uncertainty. Furthermore, embedding the algorithm into our smartphone-based imaging system additionally constrains the available computational power and memory. To overcome these limitations, the computational constraints are already considered at the design stage of our model. We therefore use lightweight and well-performing state-of-the-art networks and adapt them to our needs by further downscaling the models for the number of parameters and the computational complexity while searching for the best trade-off between model accuracy and computational efficiency. Nevertheless, having designed and trained a satisfactory algorithm, there are several additional challenges to be solved how to finally integrate the algorithm into our distributed system. The question COSA investigates is, how do we integrate the methods and networks presented by Marlin and Malte efficient and reliable into a distributed diagnosis system in rural areas? The system to be implemented consists out of the centralized and decentralized infrastructure, including encrypted connections and self-learning algorithms. As you can see, there are several subsystems as shown in the picture. First, there is a smartphone directly on the subject as presented by Malte. It also referred to as edge device due to the distributed processing nature. On the other hand, there's a central service that provides the system with high processing power and a data storage. Ultimately, the learning success from the much larger database is to be mirrored back into the local diagnosis stick algorithms in a traceable and verified manner. As you can see, the data connection between the smartphones and the AI processors is realized through a wireless connection in the middle. In rural areas, this connection can become unstable due to radio gaps. The instabilities in the connection can significantly affect the inference latency of the application. And these longer latencies can cause malfunctions due to timing errors and also reduce the battery run times of the sensor system due to the limitations at the edge. We investigate the use of applied AI in edge and cloud systems in terms of technical and energy requirements, performance and data processing to determine the optimal resource allocation and processing location depending on the link. Thanks to the Joachim Herz Foundation, we have the opportunity to improve healthcare in rural areas in the near future. Well, and I would like to thank all our sponsors again 
Open science isn't free after all, and we are happy that we can have middle here in Lübeck uh, this year. And in northern Germany, summer is a season when the rain is warm. Indeed, outside it's warm and rainy. Uh, however, you don't need to worry because the virtual Lübeck you will explore now is not wet, I suppose.